Thank you. Uh, could I ask those members of the public who are still leaving the gallery to please do so uh, quickly and quietly? Thank you for your cooperation, as we are now taking our next item of business, which is a members' business debate on motion 11509 in the name of Ruth Maguire on International Insights, a model for Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Ruth McGuire to open the debate. Ms McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To truly realise our shared ambition of eradicating male violence against women and girls, Scotland needs a progressive legal model to tackle, to tackle prostitution, a model that shifts the burden of criminality off victims of sexual exploitation and on to those who perpetrate and profit from this abuse. To prevent sexual exploitation and deliver justice to victims, the Scottish Government must decriminalise victims of sexual exploitation by repealing Section 46 of the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982, wipe previous convictions, outlaw online pimping, criminalise paying for sex and provide comprehensive, resourced support and exiting services for victims of sexual exploitation. To do this effectively, it will be important to learn from international examples. I thank members from across the Chamber for signing my motion and helping secure this debate, and I am particularly grateful to those who are contributing today, including the Minister for Community Safety, who I know to be fully and passionately committed to women's equality and ensuring Scotland is safer for all. I would like to echo the thoughts of Diane Martin, CBA Chair of Model for Scotland, when she says that she hopes this report gives confidence to Scottish lawmakers that the international evidence base is there and the time for change in Scotland is now. A Model for Scotland is an alliance of survivors, organisations and frontline services calling for the progressive model that I outlined previously. I should declare an interest as a member of the steering group of that organisation. The prostitution trade is transnational and countries face common challenges in tackling commercial sexual exploitation. The Model for Scotland report International Insights provides helpful international evidence with key learning from Sweden, Ireland, France, Iceland and the United States. In 1999, Sweden became the first country to combat demand for prostitution by criminalising paying for sex whilst decriminalising victims of sexual exploitation. Evidence shows that the proportion of men paying for sex has dropped, public attitudes have changed, and the law acts as a deterrent to sex trafficking. Key learning from Sweden includes the essential, the, how essential it is to train law enforcement agencies to ensure effective enforcement, and also that the development of nationwide network of support and ex exiting services is crucial. In 2017, Ireland criminalised paying for sex and decriminalised selling sex. Early observations reveal a shift in the burden of criminality from the victims to the exploiters. Women in prostitution report feeling more able to disclose violence against them to the police. And there is a high level of public understanding that prostitution is a form of sexual exploitation. In Ireland, partnership working was crucial to the adoption and implementation of the laws and the provision of, and su of support and exiting services for victims, a vital component of that law reform. In 2016, France decriminalised soliciting for prostitution, criminalised paying for sex and established comprehensive support provisions for victims of sexual exploitation. The same legislation established a national policy on prevention, education and training to prevent sexual exploitation. The law resulted in an immediate change in law enforcement activity, shifting from a focus on penalising victims of sexual exploitation to holding sex buyers to account. Exiting prostitution programmes have proved successful and there is a high level of public support for France's new abolitionist laws to combat prostitution. In France, strong political leadership was pivotal to securing legal reform. Iceland criminalised paying for sex in 2009. Selling sex had been decriminalised in 2007. In response to that legislation, the focus of policing shifted towards targeting and holding accountable those who create demand for prostitution. There is strong support amongst the general public for Iceland's prostitution laws. 
Key learning from there was that the prostitution trade should be tackled as part of broader efforts to combat commercial sexual exploitation in its entirety. United States made a criminal offence for pimping websites, those which advertise individuals for prostitution, to operate in 2017. That new legislation established criminal and civil liability for websites that promote and facilitate prostitution and led to a significant shrinkage of the sexual exploitation marketplace. Within 48 hours of the law being passed, major websites stopped hosting prostitution adverts. A year after the legislation was passed, the sexual exploitation advertising market remained significantly disrupted with a reduction in demand and failure of any pimping websites to recapture the market dominance of the biggest pimping website to previously operate. Key learning from there is that actions against those websites are crucial in reducing demand and deterring sex trafficking. Presiding officer, I know how proud my government is to take forward a human rights-based approach in policy making and legislation, and I welcome that we'll have a Scottish Human Rights Bill coming soon. Scotland has multiple international obligations to discourage demand for sexual exploitation. The Palermo Protocol, CEDAW, and the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. Speaking about France, I spoke of the political leadership that was required to make those changes. I think I'll give the last words to the former Minister for Women's Rights in France, Najat Valou Belkacem. She said, it is not only a question of fighting against violence, the specific oppression represented by prostitution, but it's also about teaching the principle that a woman's body is not for sale, that it is not an object, that a woman is not a commodity. Presiding officer. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. I now call Ivan McKee to be followed by Tess White. Mr. McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and it's a, a pleasure to speak in this debate, and I thank uh, Ruth McGuire for bringing it to the Chamber, um, although I did reflect that the last time I spoke on uh, a debate, a uh, member's debate on this subject was actually in December 2017, so I'm not sure how much progress has been made in the intervening six years, and I suppose questions for the Minister may want to address in her uh, summing up, is it still the Government's position uh, that prostitution is violence against women, and if so, what plans do they have to actually do something about it. Um, the motion, of, of course, um, addresses the report on international uh, comparisons and the importance of learning from experiences of other countries, uh, what works and what best practice looks like. Um, and some examples I just want to draw on um, from that work uh, with, with respect to Ireland, uh, noting that previous convictions, uh, when previous convictions for prostitution were expunged alongside the laws for uh, criminalising buying of sex, it was more likely that women would then report uh, any violence that was, uh, uh, that, that was committed against them as a consequence of that. In France, um, measures put in place to provide support, including financial and accommodation support for women exiting prostitution. Um, and as a result of that programme, 90 per cent of, of, of those women exiting prostitution found stable jobs at the end of, uh, of the programme. Um, in Sweden, the important stress for, of training for law enforcement um, required to ensure uh, effect, effective uh, uh, rollout of uh, an implementation of the legislation. Um, and also in Sweden, um, the importance of tackling trafficking alongside prostitution um, uh, and doing so together, um, in, in the words of, 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 of one person, that made Sweden a very unattractive location for traffickers as that market uh, dried up. Um, also hugely important, I think, to identify and recognise uh, the, the importance of culture change, shifting the boundaries of what is recognised to be acceptable behaviour within society, not um, normalising this uh, exploitative behaviour. And, and again, some examples in Sweden in 1996, before the implementation of the legislation, 33% um, um, of the population were in favour of criminalising payment for sex. By 2015, that had risen to 72%, and only 0.8% of men reported paying for sex in the last 12 months. 
um, in Sweden in, in 2015, the lowest um, across all of Europe. And from Iceland, um, after the implementation of the legal reforms, it was noted that it created a space where people see prostitution as something that threatens the dignity and health of the, uh, of the seller. Um, the report is also clear um, that uh, strong political leadership is an absolute prerequisite for addressing this challenge um, and that the role of government is to end violence against women, not to mitigate or legitimise it. Um, and just finally, to reflect back on some of the points I made in uh, my uh, comments in December 2017, um, addressed to those who would uh, in some way justify or be opposed to the criminalisation of, uh, of, of pain for sex. I find it very peculiar and very illuminating that they take the word of uh, supply side um, pimps uh, and industry bodies and others um, and, uh, uh, and perfectly economic lobbies in this sector that they would never um, take the word of in any, any, other, any other sector. And they're absolutely very quickly right to, um, to call out, as we all do, um, exploitative uh, sexual behaviour, um, be it in the workplace or anywhere else that relies on significant imbalances of power without recognising uh, the significant imbalance of economic power that's absolutely core to paying for sex. And, and finally, th those who would say that uh, would be opposed to, for example, um, the use of uh, asking for sex in, uh, as part of a, a, a rental contract uh, and informally would find that abhorrent. Um, but when the mechanism of exchange is not rent but is cash, find that absolutely acceptable. So I think those points deserve to be, to be made again. And again, I thank Ruth McGuire for bringing forward this motion and to those who worked on the report and the, the very helpful uh, guidelines it promotes for taking this work forward to Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McKee. I now call Tess White to be followed by Rosa Grant. Ms White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I also thank Ruth Maguire for securing the time for this afternoon's debate on such an important issue. And I know that Ruth Maguire and Rhoda Grant's work on this topic long predates my time in the Scottish Parliament. How Scotland addresses prostitution and protects vulnerable women has been discussed and debated many times in this chamber, I understand. But as Ivan McKee has pointed out today, there's, there's sadly still been no real resolution. The Scottish Government's 2021 programme for government committed to, quote, develop a model for Scotland which effectively tackles and challenges men's demand for prostitution. Work is ongoing, but the commercial sexual exploitation of women continues every day often with harrowing consequences. There are, of course, questions over the policy approach to a model for Scotland. Do you tackle prostitution in law or through other mechanisms? How do you change behaviour and reduce demand? How do you mitigate the unintended consequences of criminalising the purchase of sex? And there are ideological questions too. If two consenting adults agree to purchasing sex, should that be acceptable in the eyes of the law? Can there ever be an equal distribution of power in such a situation where sex with women is a commodity bought by men? Ruth Maguire's motion focuses on international insights and learning. And I noticed that, that the Netherlands is not mentioned. I, I some, time, some time ago, I lived and worked in the Netherlands um, where prostitution is legal as long as it involves the sex between consenting adults. In the Netherlands, it's a liberal, liberal approach where prostitution is normalized. And I have reflected on that for, for many years. But eye-opening conversations with sexual violence support services and advocacy groups, such as Byra's Place and the Women's Support Project. Since I was first elected, I've had, I've, they've had a massive impact on me. Prostitution is not about pleasure or gratification. It's about exploitation and violence. I'm still developing my own position on how we address such a complex issue as this, but the immovable starting point for me is how we best protect vulnerable women from coercion, violence and abuse. In the Netherlands, just because prostitution is legal doesn't make it safe. Forced prostitution, underage prostitution, and unsafe working conditions still happen, but under-reporting to police about what happens in the room is common practice because of prejudice. 
I note with interest that the Dutch government has been working to improve the social and legal position of sex workers. And finally, in closing, presiding officer, Diane Martin, CBE, chair of a model for Scotland, has urged the Scottish government to be courageous as it tackles the sex trade. I pay tribute to Diane's own courage and work and hope that MSPs will answer her call to action as we look how to protect women from sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms White. I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Ash Regan. Ms Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too want to thank Ruth McGuire for bringing forward this debate and also pay tribute to the work of Diane Martin on this issue. Um, Presiding Officer, I too am a proud member of the steering group for the campaign. And the campaign has now produced a number of reports and the International Insights report being the latest. And this report highlights what Scotland can learn from other countries to combat se commercial sexual exploitation. And the commercial sexual exploitation is international, so therefore it is really important that we work together. We can learn from other countries. Sweden became the first country to combat this commercial sexual exploitation by criminalising paying for sex back in 1999. And in 1996, 12.7% of men in Sweden paid for sex. In 2008, 7.6% of men paid for sex. So we see almost a halving of the number just because of that change in the law. Ruth McGuire talked about the other countries, our nearest neighbours, France shifted the burden of criminality in 2016, Ireland the year after, and in the USA in 2017 as well, they tackled pimping websites and, we, and saw a huge decrease in the number of people that were using those pimping websites and indeed in demand. And that's something that was highlighted by the model, of, model for Scotland's report on online pimping and well worth a read for those who are interested in that area. Presiding officer, it's essential we deal with demand because trafficking for sexual exploitation is the most profitable form of modern slavery in the world and is fuelled by demand. Globally, it's an industry of over a hundred billion dollars per year. And in those countries who take a more liberal approach, we see by normalising prostitution, we see a higher, higher levels of trafficking. And those who take the opposite, we have seen as a consequence that trafficking, hum, hum, human trafficking to those countries has decreased. And there are four important lessons we can learn from the countries who have tackled this issue. It's a it's crucial to support those exiting from prostitution. And in France, 600 women have benefited from the exiting programme that they set up there in conjunction with the laws back in 2016. Those exiting um, supports include financial support, accommodation support, support with the damages caused by, by prostitution, and also helping people to get their lives back on an even keel. We've also learned that training of law enforcement and police is essential. In Sweden, this wasn't maybe done as well as it could have been given they were the first country um, to promote this law and have since learned and put training in place. But it is essential that the law enforcement agencies know how to tackle this and how to prosecute. We also have to make sure that online pimping websites are tackled because that really reduces demand. Those who use those websites can hide behind their computer. And we also need strong political leadership to do this, because in every other country that's tackled it, we've seen that po politicians have um, faced strong opposition for changing this. Because there's societal pressures, because people believe a woman's place in society is lower of that than men. But also, this is a huge industry where people are making a lot of money from the exploitation of others. Ruth McGuire pointed out the international obligations we have for tackling this, to tackle violence against women, trafficking and exploitation. And it's important we take that lead. 
The Scottish Government must bring forward a framework to challenge men's demand for prostitution, and that framework needs to set out legislation to address demand, to put in place assistance for those who are exploited, and most of all, it needs to stop Scotland providing a favourable environment for exploitation. Thank you, Ms Grant. I now call Ash Regan to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Ms Regan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by commending Ruth Maguire for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and just to say that I agree entirely and wholeheartedly with the contents of her speech. Um, I would like to also commend uh, Model for Scotland on the work that they've been doing on this very important topic over the last wee while. I read the report uh, with interest, um, I think it was a month or so ago now. I thought it was very good, it was very helpful. Um, in setting out some of the information in the international context on this subject. But I'd also like to commend the CPG as well on CSE for all the work that they have also been doing on this topic. Uh, so the report is about international insights and the international context is, of course, um, very important on this. It's also instructive, I think, for a country that is looking to uh, possibly change the law on this themselves. So we have the Palermo Protocol, that's from the UN, and that is to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children. And it says that states shall adapt or strengthen legislative or other measures to discourage demand. Then we have Article 6 of CEDAW, and that says that states shall take all measures, including legislation, to suppress exploitation and prostitution. And we also have the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking, again, to discourage demand. That reducing demand is the key part of this approach. Prostitution and trafficking are linked. Prostitution creates the market that traffickers then strive to fill. So reducing demand by creating a legal framework that diminishes it as much as possible is imperative. So Sweden obviously showed the way for us on this. They were the first to criminalise the purchase of sex to achieve that suppression in demand. And uh, in the 20 or so years since Sweden uh, did this, many, many other countries have now followed suit. And I think it's up to around eight countries now. That gives us more data to look at. It gives us more experience to watch as well, to see how um, a country like Scotland might be able to follow this. Uh, Sweden is mentioned in the report. Uh, I visited Sweden myself when I was looking into this issue a few years ago, and I remember the, the prosecutors there explaining to me that, although they were very proud of their law, and rightly so, that they felt on reflection that the fact that there was no way to escalate um, in terms of, I think it was just fines, you know, you could be caught a number of times, and each time you would get the same fine. So I note from the report that it's now saying that um, Sweden has updated that now, um, and uh, the minimum penalty now is imprisonment, so I note that with interest. Um, the Scottish Government obviously have uh, their position on this, which is they have their strategy, which is called Equally Safe, and in that it does note that prostitution is violence against women, which is obviously the position I think many of us in the Chamber would take today. The problem with that is that Equally Safe has been the position of the Scottish Government for over 10 years now, and unfortunately, the law has not been updated to reflect that. And, and I will take some personal responsibility, because I know that many of the people here will know that I was the minister in charge um, in that area for a number of years. And I will say it's, it was a personal disappointment to me that I left office um, having not been able to change the law when I was the minister in government. Um, unfortunately, I learnt that the political will of just one person in a large government um, is not enough, and it was not enough in that case. But 10 years is too long. It's not good enough that this has not been given a priority. And I uh, recognise the Scottish Government has instead been focusing on other issues, some of which I would consider to actually be detrimental to women, such as the discredited GRR bill. And now, seemingly, they've learned nothing from the process of that over the last year, and they're thinking of bringing forward a conversion therapy bill. And even the proposed misogyny bill that the government are considering should be brought forward after legislation is undertaken to update the position on prostitution law, because prostitution is misogyny in action. So members may or may not be aware, but I'm planning on bringing forward a members bill on this topic this year. I am just finalising my consultation 
which will be out hopefully in the next few weeks. I'd be very happy to discuss that with anyone and I look forward hopefully to receiving cross-party support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms Regan. And I now call Michelle Thompson. Ms Thompson. I, I thank my friend and colleague Ruth Maguire for bringing this debate. As long as women are seen as a legal commodity to be bought by men, there will be no significant shift in men's violence against women. This ability fundamentally fosters a sense of male entitlement and ownership that permeates every aspect of our society. The UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, is unequivocal. States must address trafficking and prostitution if they are to eliminate discrimination against women. This must be the starting point of our discussions, and the words I've stated are simply quoting from a speech I made previously in this Parliament. Now, as we know, this place opened in 1999, and if you look at the record, the first session of the Scottish Parliament, prostitution, the need for legal reforms to protect women and girls, and also to prevent child prostitution was raised in debates, in committees, and in ministerial questioning. It was an issue pursued with vigour by a number of members from different parties, and not least the redoubtable Margot MacDonald. And discussions have continued through multiple sessions since. Now, we've heard from Ms Maguire those countries that have managed to make a shift to combat demand for prostitution by criminalising paying for sex whilst decriminalising the victims of sexual exploitation. And this means that we have the data bank we can interrogate, be it in public attitudes, deterrence and the all-important trafficking, as mentioned by Ms Grant. Yet here we are, 25 years after Sweden acted and after 25 years of the re-establishment of this Scottish Parliament, we're still debating rather than having acted. And I too note the excellent report by a model for Scotland that it recognises the Scottish Government has pledged to adopt a model for Scotland to challenge men's demand for prostitution and support women to exit sexual exploitation. The Government has also developed policy principles to underpin Scotland's framework on prostitution. But I feel I have to be frank. Pledges and principles are not enough. We should have acted years before now. Warm words and principles without action quite quickly become virtue signalling. Violence against women and girls continues, and there's just recently been data released by the Scottish Government pertaining to 2022 to 2023. I'll just give you five key points. Nearly 15,000 sexual crimes were recorded by Police Scotland, and at least 37% of them relate to a victim under the age of 18. Nearly 4,000 sexual crimes were cyber crimes, a trebling from the around 1,000 reported in 2013 to 2014. More than one in six women in Scotland has experienced online violence, and nearly 2,000 online child sex abuse crimes were recorded. On rape, the most recent data from the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey of 2019 to 2020 showed that only 22% of victims and survivors of rape reported it to the police, and one in 10 people in Scotland still think that women often lie about being raped, and nearly one in three continue to believe that rape results from men being unable to control their need for sex. So there's clearly no room for complacency. And I also would express the view that the, the government is currently consulting on some niche issues that seem to be given higher priority than the protection of women and girls. Ideologies antithetical to the interests of women are given priority. So what I seek from the Minister is a clear timeline for taking legislative action. Now, I appreciate the complexity. I think we all do, but it's been done elsewhere. Why not Scotland? Diane Martin, already referenced Chair of Model for Scotland, has so eloquently put it in the report's foreword. The role of government must be to end male violence against women, not to mitigate it or legitimise it. Let's make that our North Star. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Thompson. And I now call on Minister Siobhan Brown to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And firstly, I'd like to thank Ruth Maguire for raising this motion and bringing this debate to the Chamber. I know Ruth is very passionate about ensuring progress is made in challenging men's demand for prostitution, as is Rhoda Grant and Ash Regan, and I thank them for all the work that they have done in this area and for all the contributions today. 
I'm also pleased to see that Ruth's motion did have cross-party support on this very important issue. This debate also comes very timely following the recent 16 days of action on violence against women and girls, where this chamber again came together sending a strong message that violence against women is totally unacceptable. And I'm sure that we all agree that there is no place for sexual exploitation in Scotland. I'd also like to thank the Model for Scotland Alliance for their work raising awareness of commercial sexual exploitation. Our engagement with members of the Alliance is helping shape the, government's, the Scottish Government's framework to challenge men's demand for prostitution and their recently published report, Insights, will help inform our developing approach. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen the Women's Support Project exhibition which was held in the Scottish Parliament in November, detailing their work over the last 40 years to tackle commercial ex sexual exploitation, highlighting the energy and the commitment to tackling it from stakeholders all across Scotland and the progress that has made, and I'm very grateful for their ongoing work. I note Tess White's contribution and her insight into the, to the model in the Netherlands. And I would like to think if we fast forward 40 years from now into Scotland's future, I hope we're living in a Scotland that has overcome the normalization of behaviors associated with men purchasing sex. It's not acceptable. And challenging these attitudes is key to challenging demand. Our Equally Safe strategy recognises commercial sexual exploitation as violence against women and makes, our clear, makes clear our collective responsibility to tackle the attitudes that perpetuate it in all its forms. Our efforts to challenge demand clearly have links to wider aspects of policy, including contributing to our efforts to tackle misogyny and the ongoing scourge of inequality and poverty, which we can know can drive people into exploitation. Therefore, to truly tackle demand, we need an approach that considers the full range of social and economic factors underlining it. Our framework to challenge men's demand for prostitution and improve support for those with experience of it, and this will be published early this year, will bring together wider efforts together. It will also take an intersectional approach, setting out for the first time Scotland's strategic approach to tackling prostitution. Like the Nordic model, our framework will look at to enable women to safely and sustainably exit from prostitution. It will raise public awareness, including amongst those delivering public services. It will also clearly recognise women with experience of se selling and exchanging sex as victims of exploitation. And I'm clear that the framework's approach will provide the basis for any future legislative considerations. As you may be aware, to inform the development of our framework, we published a review of international challenge demand approaches back in 2022. Both this re report and the Model for Scotland Alliance report highlights that in addition to the criminal law, there are other important component components needed within the to challenge the demand approach. We need to continue to learn lessons from those countries who have progressed legislation as a matter of principle and understand why that has been so and why so many today advocate for that. But I am conscious that this has not always been delivered with the supporting structure that has been needed, which our framework aims to deliver for those looking to move away from prostitution and to affect the societal change that we all know is required. It is also important to recognise the need to work with international partners to truly address sexual exploitation, not just exporting it elsewhere. Our approach recognises the exploitation has no respect for borders. In that respect, please, Scotland continue to work with partners nationally and internationally to bring offenders to justice. Just yesterday, I met with the UK's new independent anti-slavery commissioner discussing trafficking and exploitation strategy. And she was very interested in the work Scotland is currently doing in regard to commercial sexual exploitation. Key to ensuring our approach to tackling demand is sustainable and that we'll have a joint up and a preventative approach. The importance of a coordinated national approach was illustrated well at the commercial sexual exploitation focused event in Ayrshire, which Ruth Maguire and myself spoke at at the 16 days of action against women and girls. 
The event brought together a wide range of practitioners, for example, from housing, health, education, and the power of working collaboratively was clearly evident. Collaborative working across policy and services was key to the development of the framework's policy principles published back in 2022. And this is a fundamental aspect of the framework, enabling us to build on existing good practice, harnessing it to deliver a more consistent approach across Scotland. One of the participants in the lived experience research which informed the framework said, there are a lot of girls out there who do this and don't want to, and they've got nothing else to turn to. They need to know what help is out there for them and who they can talk to. And this is what our framework looks to address, making support easier to access with links between mainstream and specialist service strengthened so women at any stage of their journey can access the support that they need. At last month's launch of our trafficking and exploitation strategy refresh, I heard directly from women who'd been trafficked for the purpose of commercial sexual exploitation. And I have to say that meeting them and listening to their stories was incredibly moving. And I'm really grateful for their brave and inspirational contributions because it is so important that we listen and learn. The importance of trauma-informed justice was one of the issues raised, and this aligns with the framework's approach, which acknowledges that those with experience of commercial sexual exploitation are victims of exploitation. We therefore will continue to work with Police Scotland and the wider justice partners as we look to finalise, publish and to implement the framework. We are also aligning progress with our wider work on delivering trauma-informed justice. And this includes ensuring that we build on the conclusions from the report published last year on the case for gendered intersectional approaches to justice. That report recognised that supporting women in ways which met their individual needs could have a more powerful impact on their perception of justice, leading to a greater trust in the system. To that end, and in parallel with the launch of the Equally Safe Refresh, Equally Safe in Practice training models are now available to civil servants across the Scottish Government as part of their training offer and development. And it's also important that our framework takes an adaptive approach cognizant of emerging risks related to commercial sexual exploitation. This includes online behaviours and considering our next generation ensuring that young people understand the complexities of CSE and how to stay safe online. We must also remain vigilant within our responses to crisis, for example, our collective responses to the cost of living crisis and the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Recognise the need to, as an adaptive approach and to bring together our approaches to tackle commercial sexual exploitation more holistically, we will establish a new multi-agency group on commercial sexual exploitation, which will support the framework's implementation. As I have outlined today, there is clearly positive progress across Scotland in our collective efforts to tackle CSE. However, we can and should do more, and our framework will pave the way for this. And I look forward to updating the Chamber following the framework's publication. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>